Louise, by the way. Oh, if you are, please give her my love and greetings. Yes, I will. We were very okay. close friends. And uh, he and I were on this commission that investigated the 1982 Israeli attack on Lebanon. Yes. He was the rapporteur and I was the vice chairman of the commission. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> we became uh, friends. Uh, yes, okay. Professor Falk, I think we are live now, um, at least uh, on Facebook. And it's a wonderful honor for me uh, to be in uh, conversation uh, with you. Um, today's uh, conversation is being hosted by Africa for Palestine. Um, it's a South African based organization uh, in solidarity with the uh, Palestinian people in their struggle for human rights, for dignity uh, and against uh, the occupation. Um, our focus is on Africa that is increasingly becoming a uh, contested terrain uh, as uh, the Israeli state uh, with the last blows or salvos of the Trump regime puts pressures on different African countries um, to, uh, to establish more solid links with uh, Israel. So today's guest, uh, uh, I've been around the block a good couple of times, you know, um, but I'm, I'm really awed, uh, Professor Falk, uh, to be introducing you um, and to be in your company today. Professor Falk is an American professor emeritus um, of international law at Princeton University. Um, I'll say a bit more about him in, uh, in, my, in, in, in the questions. But um, other than being uh, one of the, the greats in international law, authored nearly 50 books, um, <clears throat> authored or co-authored or edited, or co-edited. And um, in 2008, um, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Professor Falk to a six-year term as the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of the Palestinian territories occupied since 1974. Um, um, a legend, um, a life of, um, of witnessing against uh, injustice. So a very warm welcome to you, Professor Falk, as you're sitting um, uh, where you are and me right at the southern tip of, uh, of Africa. A very warm welcome to you and to the other people who have, um, who have just uh, joined us. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you and to be your guest and to have this opportunity to have a conversation about uh, Palestine. And of course, it's very meaningful for me uh, to uh, witness the involvement of South Africa in the Palestinian struggle because no country has more credibility in challenging the kind of apartheid regime that the Israelis have imposed on the Palestinian people than does uh, South Africa. And that was made clear by such uh, notable personalities as Nelson Mandela and Bishop Archbishop Tutu during their life uh, during uh, the past. So it's a great pleasure and honor and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, and it was just wonderful that you had actually remembered me from many years ago. I, I was really chuffed. Anyway, Professor Falk, by all accounts, um, you're a giant in the scholarly field of international law. You are the author of at least 20 books and the editor or co-editor of at least another 20, uh, most of them very widely acclaimed the world over. Uh, yet in the academic world or some parts of it, um, your reputation as a scholar um, can easily be sullied uh, by the fact that you are also an engaged academic or what you yourself have described uh, as a citizen pilgrim. 
that you get your hands dirty in the struggle for a more just world. And so <clears throat> the question is, being a scholar with profound professional experience in international law, but one who wears his ethical and political values on his sleeves, how have you dealt with these tensions, given that from the 60s already, you have been engaged in various forms of struggles for justice? Well, I think uh, that is, of course, a very fundamental issue in, in my life and has uh, set me apart and at odds at times with uh, colleagues and others who uh, pursue similar professional interests. My basic view is that uh, all scholarship in some level is advocacy and it's a matter of whether it's honest ad advocacy or hidden ad ad advocacy. And I think students, uh, for talking now as a teacher of students, I think students learn more when the scholarly advocacy is made explicit and they can either take it or leave it, but at least they understand that knowledge has uh, ethical and political implications. And beyond that, I felt it was also part of my pedagogical role uh, to manifest my beliefs as a particip participating member of a democratic society and therefore to engage in ways that followed from not only my work as a academician, but also as a human being with feelings and values that related to uh, the, ac the public uh, activities of my government. And I increasingly found myself at odds with what the United States was doing in various parts of the world, starting with the Vietnam War, which was for me a transformative moment. I went to North Vietnam twice during the war and began to understand these kind of international conflicts from the perspective of the victim, from the, uh, and the helplessness of the Vietnamese in the face of this high technology a uh, war machine that was devastating their country. And at the same time, the almost miraculous political fact that they won the war. And it's uh, the lesson of, of that experience has stayed with me, the sense that you can have total command of the battlefield and still lose the war which is a lesson that uh, the American Pentagon hasn't learned and doesn't want to learn because if they learned it, they'd lose 90% of their budget. And that's not something they want, wish to do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, you have defined yourself as an American Jew um, whose Jewishness signifies above all, and I'm quoting, to be preoccupied with overcoming injustice and thirsting for justice in the world. And that means being respectful towards other peoples, regardless of their nationality or religion, and empathetic in the face of human suffering, whoever and wherever victimization is encountered, unquote. Now, needless to say, this understanding of Jewishness, uh, I put to you, is at odds with most Israelis' uh, idea of Jew and that, and they do form the largest uh, Jewish population in the world. In fact, some may argue that your definition is so universal that it does not require any affinity to Judaism at all. So can you tell us a bit more about the space, the personally indispensable intersec intersection between your Jewishness on the one hand 
and your identity as a citizen pilgrim. Um, on the other, this identity that compels you to push for the marginalized and oppressed, and oppressed rather than live an existence of knee-jerk responses to the demands of the Jewish tribe, however unjust uh, these may be uh, at times. Uh, well, of course, those are uh, complicated issues. I would begin by saying that it's not, uh, I haven't so much defined myself as a Jew. I've been defined by others as a Jew. I grew up in a relatively secular humanistic uh, atmosphere where a specific religious identity was not uh, emphasized. And uh, it was the middle of Manhattan in New York City. And it, it uh, I never thought of myself primarily uh, from that kind of ethnic or religious uh, point of view. And it was only actually after I became the UN Special Rapporteur that I was uh, alleged to be a self-hating Jew and uh, uh, other such epithets uh, were, were used uh, really to damage uh, me as the messenger so as to avoid the strength of the message. I mean, it was a classic instance of that, but, uh, uh, but to the extent then that I, I didn't want to disown being a Jew or, or uh, deny that uh, uh, kind of uh, background that I had, and therefore to the extent that I affirmed uh, that Judaic uh, element in my uh, past, uh, it was, as you suggest from the quote, it was to emphasize more the prophetic side of Judaism and the uh, uh, biblical commitments to a people chosen to serve the cause of justice uh, and not the chosen people as a superior race that had some kind of mandate to uh, uh, rule over others. So that uh, I also drew, as many Jews have done over the uh, decades, a sharp distinction between Zionism as a political project to establish a Jewish state in Palestine and the Judaism as a religion. And I think the merger of, the, of Zionism with uh, anti-Semitism uh, is a, a very unfortunate development where those of us who support uh, the BDS campaign, for instance, are labeled as uh, per se anti-Semitic, whereas uh, during the South African period where uh, BDS was prominent aspect of those who were in various ways uh, opposed to the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, BDS was controversial, but those that supported it and were active in it, including at my university, were never subjected to any kind of punitive reaction. And uh, this uh, success of Zionism in inducing uh, uh, European and American political elites to act as if BDS is a, uh, a kind of expression of the hatred of Jews is such a uh, deforming way of trying to avoid criticism and censure, and I think has a very bad effect on uh, the, the real uh, protection of minorities, including Jews, against hatred. It, it uh, makes it almost seem justifiable to feel 
uh, hostility uh, toward Jews if they if they insist upon identifying with the uh, criminal dimensions of the Israeli state policy. So I don't know if I've clarified anything, but it, it really uh, is an issue which, uh, to me, uh, avoids the, the central fact that we are living in a world where we have to, uh, in a sense, uh, be respectful and loving toward others, regardless of our skin color or our uh, place of birth or the religion that we cho choose or were uh, given at birth, that we're, uh, as the uh, poet W.H. Auden put it, we must love one another or die. I mean, that, that there is this sense of interconnectedness that is bound up with human history and the COVID crisis now gives it a existential dimension in terms of uh, human health, that boundaries uh, are no, no longer uh, protect us, no longer give us security. We have to deal cooperatively with the common global challenges, or even as a species, our future is under a dark cloud. Thanks for that, uh, Richard. Um, so uh, as I said uh, when introducing you, uh, you served the six year term as uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestine territories. And you succeeded um, the uh, South African uh, jurist, um, gosh, whose name slips me now. John Dugard. Uh, John Dugard, yes, Professor John Dugard. <clears throat> Looking back now, um, six um, years after your term concluded, what would you say are the major challenges that you faced in struggling to fulfill your mandate? Well, I mean, the most obvious challenge were these um, very uh, aggressive uh, militant Zionist NGOs that uh, did their best to um, uh, divert attention from uh, the uh, findings uh, of Israeli violations of international humanitarian law and of human rights law, and to try to make the conversation center around uh, the, my bias as special rapporteur. And um, I think that, as I used to say, you didn't really have to be objective to come to the same conclusions I came to uh, in evaluating Israeli occupation policies. Even someone with a 90% pro-Israeli feeling, if they witnessed the facts truthfully, they'd come to essentially the same conclusions uh, that I did. And, uh, in some ways, Israel even acknowledges uh, the imposition of settlements on the occupied territories, which is clearly a violation of international law, the imposition of a blockade on Gaza that has lasted for more than a, a decade, reliance on various forms of collective punishment that are explicitly prohibited, by Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, and on and on, uh, a litany of uh, violations of international law uh, that are ignored internationally and have caused great suffering uh, to the Palestinian people over an incredibly long period of time. And I tried to argue as special rapporteur that an occupation which uh, gives no rights to the people who are occupied is an intolerable 
uh, state of affairs that goes really against the idea that it originally led to this kind of legal framework, which was that it was a very temporary arrangement of belligerent occupation after a war, and that it wasn't intended uh, to be a permanent state of affairs. And uh, when after the 1967 war, Israel was basically instructed to withdraw from the occupation and go back to the territorial uh, limits that had been established at the end of the 1947-48 war, uh, which it has refused to do and never wanted to do because part of the Zionist vision is that they would uh, expand to uh, take over uh, either the whole or at least uh, most of the promised land. And the promised land includes Jerusalem and uh, the, uh, the West Bank, which they've never called the West Bank. They always call it Judea and Samaria, the biblical names, which is a code way of saying they don't accept the international consensus and never have. And uh, the complicity of the United States even in the pre-Trump era, was one of trying to uh, enable Israel to establish such uh, strong facts on the ground as to make their occupation of Palestine irreversible. And at the same time, hypocritically proclaim support for a two-state solution. You couldn't do both. You either had to uh, set aside and protect the autonomy of uh, the Palestinian, the territory that Palestine uh, uh, occupied itself at the end of the 1948 war, uh, so-called Green Line, or you had to uh, acknowledge that Israel was entitled to uh, displace the indigenous population from their own country and establish a Jewish state in a non-Jewish society. I mean, when the Balfour Declaration was declared way back in 1917, which pledged the UK to support the establishment of a Jewish homeland, not a Jewish state, but a Jewish homeland in Palestine, it was a purely colonial gesture. The Palestinian people were never consulted and the Jewish minority in Palestine at that time was somewhere between eight and 10%. So that it, the, the idea of establishing a Jewish state uh, as the exclusive prerogative of the Jewish people is a, uh, extraordinary displacement of a native or, or indigenous people on, uh, on behalf of a settler colonial undertaking, because there's no other way of looking at, uh, no other uh, uh, plausible way of looking at the degree to which uh, uh, subsidized uh, immigration to Palestine uh, had the intention of uh, displacing and dispossessing uh, the people who resided there for generations. It was an understandable undertaking from uh, a Jewish point of view in relation to the Nazi experience and the Holocaust, but it doesn't uh, validate uh, making the Palestinian people pay the costs of what was essentially a European tragedy. And that really was, in my view, the essence of uh, the uh, original sin, so to speak, of Zionism, was this notion that you could make a Jewish state uh, prevail in a non-Jewish society and to do that, you had to engage in ethnic cleansing, get rid of a lot of the Palestinian people who were living there so 
that you could proclaim yourself a democracy with a majority Jewish population. Plus, in an era of decolonization, you had to use uh, a lot of force to deal with nationalist resistance. It was a period of anti-colonialism and the idea that the Palestinians would lie back and just allow this uh, process of uh, making their country into a Jewish state was very uh, naive if it, if it was ever believed at all. And, and so the tragedy is one of the international community being so complicit in allowing this kind of uh, anti-historical uh, experience to uh, become uh, legitimated to the extent of welcoming Israel into the UN before there was any solution of the Palestinian struggle for self-determination and basic rights. Yeah. So, you know, um, um, Professor Falk, um, you've referred now to uh, to the Trump regimes and, and even before that, the role of the United States. But at a superficial glance, it would appear as if international law has gone a bit of, has gotten a bit of a trashing um, with the increasing disdain being shown for it by the United States, but also by other countries such as the UK and Brazil. You see, for example, that a number of African countries are under significant pressure by the US on the one hand and Gulf countries led by Saudi Arabia on the other to blur the lines between Israel and the occupied territories. And they pressurized, uh, they are pressurized to move their capitals to Jerusalem, for example, which uh, obviously is uh, legally, it is occupied territory. How irreversible do you think are these uh, setbacks? Uh, I think it's hard to say. I think it, these regimes that have uh, succumbed to the uh, Trump pressure to normalize relations uh, with Israel uh, really governed by coercion. And the people, as far as one can tell, still are in uh, strong solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. So to the extent that the region experiences a turn toward democratization, I think these uh, moves in the last days of the Trump presidency are very susceptible to being uh, reversed. But how, uh, how soon and uh, how the US post-Trump will treat these issues is very uh, unclear at this point. But I wouldn't uh, rule out important, uh, let me put it this way, I wouldn't rule out a second coming of the Arab Spring in which uh, there was a renewed uh, uprising of the people to secure governments more responsive to their material needs and their uh, values and perspectives. And so I'm not as discouraged as the uh, situation appears at the moment where even the Arab world has betrayed the Palestinian struggle in this uh, very uh, self, um, uh, preoccupied manner for to get better weapons and to have trading uh, uh, advantages with uh, Israel and the U.S. and possibly Europe. Uh, it's it's uh, a further indication that these Arab governments do not reflect uh, either the uh, values that are enshrined in international human rights and international law, or the uh, preferences of their own citizens. 
So I think that's an unstable uh, kind of development. Unstable uh, frameworks of this sort can, if reinforced geopolitically, last a long time, unfortunately. So uh, we don't know really how the future will unfold in the region, except to say it's in turmoil. And when you have turmoil, you can have some very unpredictable outcomes suddenly emerge. Uh, Professor Falk, you know, you've used some pretty strong language uh, in your various rebukes of the Israeli regime and its security military apparatus, words such as genocide and war crimes. Uh, in a June 2007 article, you wrote, and I quote, slouching toward a Palestinian holocaust, unquote. And here you compared some Israeli policies with regards to the Palestinians to the Nazi record of collective punishment. And you warned that Israel may be planning a holocaust in the same way that Nazi Germany did. Can you comment for us, please, on your use of genocide and war crimes in relation to Israel? And how do you justify these charges in international law? Uh, what makes, uh, uh, what do you make of the accusation that you use these words far too loosely? Uh, well, I should say, first of all, that the article was written in a uh, journalistic context as an opinion piece, and it was intended really as a warning more than as a judgment. Uh, if, it's, if it is, if that 2007 uh, article, which has brought me lots of grief over the years, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, read fairly, I think, it would be seen that I don't make those judgments. I say that it, there are these tendencies in, in the way in which the Palestinian people are being uh, victimized and their rights denied, and that this is being done not only to uh, individuals, but to the Palestinian people as a whole, that there is this kind of collective victimization, which, as you well know, is a uh, core element of an apartheid kind of regime. And uh, maybe I, mis you, I misuse the very inflammatory uh, terminology of genocide. And I have had second thoughts myself as to whether that was uh, the right way to get my uh, message across. And uh, I haven't used it really subsequently. I have used apartheid uh, quite consistently, which is a crime against humanity uh, by uh, the Rome statute that governs the International Criminal Court. And there's an international convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of apartheid. And I, I do believe that the practices and policies of Israel toward the Palestinian people, not only under occupation, but also with respect to the refugees and the exiles amounts to a, a form of uh, discrimination based on race. And that this uh, constitutes the essence of the apartheid crime. It's very different as, I as I've pointed out many times uh, than the South African uh, form of apartheid. But the crime is detached from its historical origins and refers to the maintenance of control by one race or religion or ethnicity over another in a discriminatory form that relies on inhuman and criminal uh, devices to maintain that control. And uh, I participated in a long study that was uh, commissioned after I was special rapporteur 
by the uh, regional commission in the Middle East uh, that's uh, located in Beirut that made a study of the policies and practices of Israel toward the Palestinian people as a whole and came to this conclusion that, that, that it was uh, beyond reasonable doubt a form of apartheid. And so I would stand by that and say one final thing about genocide that uh, it is used and was used then in a, a somewhat careless way by myself because one needs to distinguish between uh, the moral, political and legal uh, understanding of genocide. And certainly there was no evidence and still is no evidence of genocide in that legal sense of a uh, documented uh, plan to eliminate in whole or part a particular ethnicity or race. But it was genocidal in the sense, the political and moral senses of collectively punishing a people because of their identity and, uh, and, and not dealing with people as individuals uh, entitled to uh, due process and to the protection of their human rights. So I think there's an important distinction uh, academically or intellectually between genocide and genocidal behavior. And I would, uh, if pressed to defend the language I use, I would uh, rely more heavily on that distinction. Uh, thank you very much. That was really good. Um, <laughs> I have one last question for you, um, uh, Professor Paul. You know, I am sometimes tempted to call you Richard, uh, yes, but, you, uh, ach, you know, it's just, um, yeah. Um, I'll so, call you Farid if you call me Richard. Oh, no, you, you Bar it's a fair bargain, isn't it? <laughs> please, please call me Farid. Um, but you know, at your age, uh, Richard, what inspires your refusal to hang up your boots in general? And more specifically, what would you say to inspire this generation? that in relation to human rights and justice, particularly for the Palestinians, that after more than 70 years, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And that light is not of an oncoming train. Uh, well, those are uh, very probing uh, questions. Uh, I mean, the, the honest answer to the first part about why do I keep doing what I've been doing is, is um, I could give a flippant reply that that's the only thing I know how to do. And so uh, I, and I feel a emotional and uh, uh, ethical solidarity with those that have been struggling and are victimized. And I've made many friends over the years with uh, people in these situations. And so I find that my own uh, engagement with life, uh, which I continue to regard as a precious gift, uh, depends on not withdrawing from these struggles and not, uh, not treating uh, the uh, engagement that I previously had as some kind of uh, uh, activity that you can uh, legitimately retire from as long as you're uh, healthy enough uh, to participate in some way that at least you feel is useful. So, uh, and I'd, I'd say that I get satisfaction from this uh, engagement and from uh, seeking to uh, understand how the struggle for justice 
uh, can be more effectively uh, waged in the face of changing world conditions. And then on a very prosaic level, I also uh, feel that future generations uh, deserve my best efforts or the best efforts of all of us. And I think of my own children and grandchildren and the kind of world that my generation is uh, leaving to them, which is not, I think, as desirable a global situation as my parents and grandparents uh, bequeath to me. So I have that kind of uh, sense also of uh, engagement, I guess it would be called. Uh, and then so, uh, so far as uh, the uh, second part of the question about it's really a question about hope. What can we hope for? And uh, I, when people say, well, you seem, so I, I'm accused both by some of being too optimistic and by others by being too pessimistic. And my real response is that either optimism or pessimism are a form of hubris because we can't know the future. Uh, the, uh, the future is a, uh, a, a, uh, to some extent a black box and therefore we should struggle for what we believe because that's possible and as long as it's not as long as we have no reason to believe it's impossible uh, there is no justification for abandoning a struggle so that uh, I have the idea in the re relation specifically to what we've been talking about, the Palestinian struggle, which looks to some uh, as a kind of lost cause at this stage, uh, that that implies a knowledge of the future that is not part of what we as uh, limited human beings are capable of perceiving. And so as long as that uncertainty uh, exists, my solidarity will also continue. Um, Professor Polk, um, thank you very you much. Promise you, Richard. Richard, uh, <laughs> comrade Richard, you know, um, when we started our conversation, you reminded me that uh, both of us were in the trenches against apartheid uh, in those years already. Um, yeah. And so, as you say, you know, uh, we fight in order to be true to ourselves because we know nothing else and not because we're necessarily going to win. Exactly. Um, we have to live with ourselves and look at ourselves in the mirror every day. Uh, we have to tell our children what we did, uh, not whether we succeeded or whether we didn't succeed. Uh, you are 24 hours in a day, what did you do? Anyway, um, it's not for me to add to your wisdom, Richard. Um, thank you very much, and I will pass your regards on to Kader Asmal's widow, uh, Louise, that we chatted about earlier on. And on behalf of Africa for Palestine, I want to say thank you very, very much. Uh, we wish you lots of energy and a good health. We're glad that you're out of, um, uh, that you're not in the United States at the moment. It's not the safest country in which to be. Um, and uh, stay safe where you are, Richard. Thank, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you, Fareed. I really enjoyed our conversation and I wish you well and hope we can meet in person one of these days. Yes. Take Thank care, you. Richard. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I know. <laughs>